The uh, topic of the program is uh, Navy Marine Aviation. We've got uh, two gentlemen. Jack Christopher is on the uh, your far left. Jack was in seaplanes, PBMs. And we did a program at our World War II roundtable a few years ago. And people don't understand that uh, a seaplane has to come down in the ocean or a lake or some uh, body of water and set up its own airfield. We'll let Jack talk about that. Next to me is Lyle Bradley, Corsair pilot. Uh, Lyle, although uh, he often talks about World War II, also had uh, was mobilized for the Korean War and, uh, and flew in the Korean War. So uh, we'll see how far we can uh, we, we can get him to talk about flying Corsairs. Uh, Jack, if you could uh, tell us. How did you get into uh, involved with the PBM? Well, I wanted to be a naval aviator to begin with. I lived South Minneapolis, and during the early years, you could go on the Naval Reserve Base, it was called. They're all biplanes, so I used to, and there was no guard to just walk in there. So I became interested in naval planes. In high school, I took the higher math and so forth. And, and physics. Then the war came, and uh, at that time you need to have two years of college or pass their entrance exam, the written exam. Well, I got out of high school two weeks before graduation and, and, and tried to enlist in the Navy, so I took the uh, written exam and I passed it. So I take my physical and I passed that until I took the colorblind test. And I couldn't pass the blue green color, the blue dots, you know. So they sent me home. So I didn't know what to do. I was, you know, I was devastated. And I just waited until I was drafted and went out to Fort Snelling. At that time they said uh, you guys in the Navy, if you pass your physical high enough, you could go in the Navy. And, so I chose that. Then I went to boot camp, Farragut, Idaho, and took a bunch of tests there. And I passed those tests high enough so I could go to a service school. So they asked where you want to go. I thought, well, aviation important. I need airplanes anyhow. So I took that physical, and they wrote rejected high, too high blood pressure. So I can well, what I was going to do, I went home on leave and I came back and on the bulletin board, Navy Short School, they had my name. So the only thing I could figure out is I had put down, I worked four years at Twin City Gun Club, so they probably figured that they, that was more interested in uh, blood pressure. So anyhow, I went to Norman, Oklahoma for Orton School, and that's where I met Jack top 10 percent of the class could be rated the one red stripe which is equal to a sergeant in the army it's called third crest petty officer and i got that and they asked for volunteers for aerial gunnery and said well i'll no volunteer for that so i had to take a flight physical for that and i passed the blue green flight colored line test three times the only thing i could figure out is the lousy diet I was eating in high school, and the good balance diet I was eating in the Navy, was passed me or else God didn't want me to be a pilot. But anyhow, that's, that's how I... Uh, that's how you got in. Lyle Bradley. Lyle is part of a group. There we go. Uh, you're from uh, Minnesota, right? No, I'm from Iowa. Don't hold any Oh, God. What, do you have a passport to get in? Yeah. Uh, how did you get in the, uh, how, how did you get out of the Navy Air into the Marine Air? Well, I went through the program like all the other naval aviators did. We got our wings, but we could choose. Uh, 
if you were in the top 10% uh, of the gunnery scores, uh, you could uh, then uh, choose to, to go in the Marine Corps. Um, and I had done some boxing in college, uh, so uh, two of us had enlisted in the Marine Corps in, in, during college. But you know, at that time, you had to be a college graduate to get into, into aviation. And uh, then all of a sudden they changed it, and Jack was commenting about that, and that made the difference, because aviation was really what I wanted to get into. And uh, so then uh, graduation, I uh, got in the, uh, in the Marine Corps, and uh, Marines had some advantages and some disadvantages. One of the things that uh, they didn't want, uh, they didn't have any Corsairs on board carriers at that time, because the Corsair was considered a no-no by the Navy. They put such a high emphasis on not scratching the paint on the ships that they didn't want a Corsair. But anyway, the British were using Corsairs, doing it very successfully. So uh, we were Corsair, we had a lot of squadrons of Corsair Marine pilots. So they said, finally, we need eight squadrons of Marines on board. And so I went on two squadrons at a time, and uh, we ended up uh, on the carrier Bennington, um, and uh, that's where we're. Uh, how, how many hours in World War II did you have in the Corsair? Oh, God. Um, I can't, I can't break them down, but I've got just under 2,000 hours total in the Corsair. Uh, that includes I, Korea, right? I would guess maybe half of it, something like that. Uh, what percentage of your time was uh, ground-based versus carrier-based? Well, in combat, in World War II, all the time I had was in carriers. Um, and in Korea, about half the time of carriers and half the time of ground-based. One of the things, uh, and you, you correct me, uh, but the designation in the Navy Marine, V means fighter, correct? V, v is aircraft. Is aircraft. V, M, F. Is, v is aircraft, M is marine, and, and then uh, F is fighter or tag or whatever the last letter is. Which would include... Uh, Hellcats, Wildcats, uh, Dauntless, except now the Dauntless would be a t torpedo, right? Dauntless was a dive bomber. Dive bomber. Uh, Jack, with regard to the seaplane, what was the designation uh, criteria for seaplanes? It was a PBM-5 patrol bomber made by Martin, and our squadron was VPB-27, which meant patrol bombing squadron 27. What were the, uh, the early part of the war was the PBY, is that right? They replaced the uh, PBY about the uh, last two years of the war. It was a lot bigger airplane, more heavily armed. Of course, the PBY had any guns on it at all. It had a greater range, and a bigger bomb load, and a bigger crew. Uh, one of the things that intrigues me, and I, I commented on it earlier, uh, you, you got to understand uh, a fighter has a base of a carrier or a land anyway. With regard to seaplanes, how are you supported? How are you supported with the Ships, yeah. We had uh, seaplane tenders that uh, in the forward areas, the seaplane tenders would go in to an island. Uh, the patrol bombers went into nearly every island right at the beginning of every island invasion. Seaplane tenders would go in and drop buoys, all over, just like the sailboats that lay in the Columbus and, and uh, uh, Calhoun and so forth. And the seaplane would come in and tie up to the buoys. And you had to have half the crew on the plane for 24 hours a day. So, you know, next day trade back and forth. But you had to have one pilot, one radio man, one ordnance man, and two or three mechanics. 
So we lived on the airplane just as much as we lived on the ship. And the, the seaplane tenders uh, maintained the airplane. The big seaplane tender, you could hoist the PBM on the deck. There were the small seaplane tenders that looked like a destroyer that uh, couldn't do that. You know, they had six flight crews to each one. That was our squadron. We had we had to have three of the small seaplane tenders just for one squadron. But the seaplane tenders supported the squadron. At, at the end of the war, were they developing a four-engine seaplane? They, they had a four-engine seaplane, the Consolidated the Coronado, which they probably came out pretty much the same time as the PBM, but it really was too big and it wasn't as good. So they used it more as a transport plane uh, later in the war. Can I say something about seaplanes? Uh, now listen, do I need to get between the two of you? Yeah, talk to you tell us a seaplane story as a Corsair pilot. Well, I, w I was instructing at Pensacola, Florida after Korea, and uh, we were supposed to go to Washington for some conference. So they flew uh, eight of us in a PBY to Washington, but we got involved with some very severe weather. So severe that we had to get way out over the Atlantic Ocean to get around the weather. The two pilots that were flying that PBY got so tired, they said, we can't continue. Would anybody volunteer? So I went up there and volunteered, flying the PBY. I'd never flown a PBY. Now the PBY does not have any autopilot on it. You have to muscle it all the way through. I was sitting there for an hour and a half, and it was all I could do to raise my arms. Flown PBY? No, no, I'll tell you. Anybody that flies the PBY deserves a Congressional Medal of Honor. <laughs> I'm telling you, that is the worst time I've ever had as far as flying goes. My arms were just ready to fall off. Anyway, <laughs> that was after Korea, though. Yeah, that was after Korea, yeah. I, well, I didn't even realize that the PBY was still a, a, an operational plane. Oh, yeah. uh, how, how, long, how long was it operational? Can't answer that. Jack, do you know how long PBY was operational? Well, they were like they were used all through the war, but the PBM took over to the combat operations uh, the last two years of the war. Of course, PBY is still flying now. Incidentally, I was asking what air show we had a PBY come in once, and I asked the pilots. I said, "You guys ever land on water now?" He says, "No, nobody knows how to navigate on water." <laughs> and, and you know that's a key point because the uh, the seaplane really depended on a rudder and its engines to uh, navigate around, right? Yeah. As soon as you you got in a seaplane, as soon as you start the engines were moving. You didn't have any brakes. You didn't have a st no steerable nose wheel. You didn't have a steerable outboard motor. It was just, uh, you were at the mercy of the wind. It's just like uh, getting in your car, as soon as you turn the key, you're moving, you don't have any brake, you don't have any steering wheel. So, you did control the plane by the rudders and the engine, revving one engine or the other. But, you know, you have to be a big circle and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, another thing you had to worry about, like I said, the wind is like a big sail. You had to worry about currents. When you were in the islands, every time the tide came in and out, there was a big rise and fall of currents. The water rushed in, the water rush out. You had to worry about underwater reefs. So then you had to take off, you had to worry about your runway, which is not nice and level, usually going up or down three or four feet more. So the seaplane gave you more problems just taking off and landing than the mission sometimes. Did you ever have any problems with uh, grounding the planes, uh, hitting uh, reefs? Yeah, we hit reefs twice. That was quite a hassle, trying to save the plane. 
luckily, the last one we had was after the war was over. The plane was so beat up they didn't want to save it, so they let it sink. Too bad. We had visions of flying it back to San Francisco and flying it under the Golden Gate Bridge. Lyle, uh, what was uh, a couple of your memorable missions in World War II? Me? Well, one, one mission that stands out because it's comes back to haunt me a few times. Well, I've got, uh, I've got an actual combat report here. I can't read it because it's too hard to have my glasses. Yeah, wait. He's, uh, he's, he's talking. We had a hard time understanding the Japanese language, so we gave a nickname to all their different airplanes. And one of the planes that we called, it was a twin engine, high altitude fighter, very good one, and we called it the Nick. And on a mission that we had to uh, a place in Japan that had an aircraft factory, and uh, we, hit the, we hit the plane very well. On the rendezvous, I spotted this plane ahead of us, and it happened to be a Nick. So I tally-hoed it, and uh, the, the division leader couldn't see it, so he turned the lead over, and I went in and I hardly trust the trigger and the plane blew, uh, blew up and uh, that was it. <clears throat> That's part of war. Now, five years later, we were recalled to Korea and I was sitting... Okay, I was sitting in a Japanese uh, railroad station uh, and uh, there was a, a Japanese man sitting right across from me glaring at me because I had a uniform on and had my wings on and I could tell that he wasn't happy. That's not unusual in a foreign country, you know, when you beat them in a, in a war. So anyway, uh, this guy got up and walked around the end of the table, and I didn't know whether he was going to hit me or what. He was a good-sized Japanese guy. So because I'd had some boxing experience, I turned and all ready to parry his, his blow. And in perfect English, better than I used, he said, what kind of plane did you fly? Now that was the start of something that was very special. He was now a Japanese doctor, and he had been a Japanese pilot in World War II, and he flew Nicks. He got the recognition manual out, and there it was that, that he flew. So I carelessly told him, I said, a friend of mine shot one of those down. Oh, he wanted to know where, and so on. So I pointed out the approximate spot. Then he found. Then I found out he flew Nicks. He was in a Nicks squadron, and in the only squadron of Nicks in South Japan. So therefore, the guy I shot down had to be from his squadron. We got together several times. We got to know each other very well, and we killed a number of bottles of sake. That's Japanese rice wine. And uh, anyway, finally, I told him. I said, I have an admission to make that I shot down your friend. He told me the name of the guy and everything about him. And he kept records on everybody in the squadron, very carefully. He also liked music. So he and I uh, put on a couple musical programs for all the friends that could in, in, uh, listen to English and so on. It was very, very interesting. The fact that he had been a Japanese pilot and we became very good friends. Um, and I think something about wars, for example, wars sometimes increase hatreds and sometimes they decrease hatreds. And there was an example. Oh, that was one. You don't want more than that. Do you? I want another one. Oh, want another. <laughs> well, another one was in, uh, in Korea. Uh, a guy from Texas was a pilot and we were a, a, a unit. One of the things we were concerned about in Korea was that they were running down truckloads of supplies at night to feed the North Koreans. So we had to stop that. And we did, we did some night flying and also, but they would hide these things so cleverly in the daytime that they were hard to find sometimes. Well, one day, and I carry binoculars all the time with me. By the way, I'm, a, I'm one of these birders, you know, that go around looking at birds all the time. You've probably seen some of them. Anyway, that's why I had the binoculars but also they're very valuable in flying. So what we could do is we could fly at five, 6,000 feet and we could look down in binoculars and cover the ground much better than we could by flying low. And it wasn't that near as dangerous. 
Well, I spotted at the bottom of a cliff, way at the bottom of the cliff, the sort of undercut, about five or six trucks all parked. All I could see was the front end of the truck. So I told uh, to uh, Phillips that uh, that's where it was, so we should go down there. Well, the problem was that the, the, the Chinese and the, and the North Koreans were well in the crates there, and so they had, they had all kinds of trenches. So what we did is we flew over and we worked the, we worked the thing out. So we, one guy down this way, one guy down here, we'd be shooting at the same time at the different trenches. We had 20 millimeter cannons in our Corsairs at that time. During World War II, we had 50 calibers. So anyway, we went, went down and went all the way down to the bottom and I also had napalm with me. Napalm is the jelly gasoline and it burns very, very well. And what I was going to try to do was come down low, turn the airplane like this, and throw that napalm right in underneath that bluff and get all of those trucks burning. And I did a terrible, made a terrible mistake. On the stick of the Corsair, right at the at the very top is the trigger for the for the for the cannons and wings. Down below is the is the, is the bombing switch for, for the bombs and so on. And because we were moving around so much, I screwed up and I hit the wrong switch, and I hit the switch of the, of, the, uh, of the rockets that we had on the wing. Rockets go this way, and we were down in a trench, there was no other place to go but right over the top. One of the rockets exploded and hit the bottom of the airplane. I put 19 holes in the bottom of the airplane. Luckily, uh, none of them were bothered the plane except one little rock, and I could have brought it today because I still have it, it's about that big around, and it got jammed in the aileron. Now the aileron is the wing, wing control unit, and what happened when that jammed up there, I could not move the stick. I, I forced it, boy, I realized I was going right for this big bluff. So we have an, an aileron tab over here, but it's very slow reacting, but you never saw anyone turn an aileron tab so fast in your life. And Joe McPhail, who was flying with me, Holler, he said, bail out, bail out. He says, you're going to... And I, well, I didn't bail out, but I did take a few tree branches with me. Uh, that, so that was, a, that was a close call. Anyway, that's part of flying, you know, you never know who one did next to the... Well, it, the, uh, the, the early Corsairs, uh, I think the uh, Marine unit that made it famous was Pappy Boyington, the VMF 214. Uh, the Corsair, again, was not uh, early judged to be a good carrier base. Can you explain why that was the case and how they remedied that? Well, if there's no admirals or anything in the audience, I guess I can get away with expressing a few views. The Navy, um, the Navy did not like the Corsair for several reasons, and I can understand it. Uh, because the long nose that housed that R2800 engine uh, did get in the way when you're coming into a carrier. Watch your view a little bit. So, if the carrier is here with his camera, you have to come around and you have to keep that airplane turning constantly in order to keep the LSO, landing signal officer, there, you know, with the flags. He's standing right here and you want to keep him in line all the way. You don't level your wings until you get right to the edge of the carrier and then he gives you your cut. And so the, 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 the path for the Corsair is a little different than the path for the F-6F, which was the other carrier fighter. And the Navy did not like the Corsair for that reason. Now, the British were flying Corsairs, but they had another problem. The Corsair, when the wings collapse this way, or fold this way, they're too tall for the British carrier, so they had to cut 14 inches off each of the wing, wing tips. And they were very successful. I talked to some of the British pilots, and they said it doesn't bother things at all. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the Navy didn't have to do that, so they could take the Corsairs just as they came from the factory. But finally they realized the Corsair was faster than the F-6F, and it was speed was very important because the Japanese had so many kamikazes coming down, and we were chasing. That was our primary mission, to protect the fleet and they found out that the Corsair could do it better than the F-6 and finally the Admiral said, bring the Corsairs on board. Well, we were the only ones who were flying Corsairs at that time, so they got some, some Marine uh, units on board. Uh, comparative speed between the Corsair and the uh, uh, Hellcat, 
What's the difference? Yeah, the speed wise. Well, a difference, different difference with speed. That was a primary thing. I think they. I flew both of them. Both both planes were tremendous. Both had the same engine in it, and and uh, they they both were very good planes. The Corsair was faster than the F six F. And I turning radius time. was about the same. Pardon? Turning radius. The turning radius. Turning radius. I would say I'd say probably the F six F could turn a little tighter than the Corsair, but not much, not much. Not done. Uh, the uh, armament loads. If you keep those doggone airplanes quiet, we can hear better. Uh, go ahead. The armaments. Uh, oh, armament. Armament's the same. Uh, the uh, F six F had uh, had the same thing in World War Two and uh, in, and uh, Korea. Same thing. Jack, uh, we interrupted you a while ago. You wanted to say something. I'll change it slightly. Uh, most people have never heard of a PBM, and most people don't know what it did during the war. You know, I got a record of what just one squadron of 15 PBMs did. They sank 35 ship, Jap ships, damaged 26 more, destroyed 24 shore installations, shot down 12 Jap planes, damaged 9, and rescued 20 pilots. That's just one squadron of 15 planes. So the PBM's got a heck of a lot that nobody ever heard about. Now the other thing I was going to tell a little story, I thought I was going to read it, but I can't read it in here in my glasses. Well, I got the actual combat report, so I'll tell it. So, the June 12, 1944, two of PBMs, ours and another one, had two torpedoes, were taken off to attack a Jap convoy coming out of the LC. So Father Down reported that we made the attack. Now we went in first and dropped our torpedoes. So the, the reports that we dropped our tor torpedoes and they're running hot, the other guy did too. In reality, only one of them dropped. We were getting any aircraft fire at the same time. And also, when we left, it was sunny and everything we got there was cloudy and rainy. And so the pilot says, I'm going to go around and make another attack, and I'm in the ordinance to see if I can drop it. So I got a screwdriver, and we made a human chain, had a guy in the hull with earphones on, and a guy halfway up into the wing access hole, and I was all the way in the wing with the screwdriver. So the pilot went in, and he said, drop, and then the guy in the earphones on hit that guy, halfway up the wing and the legs, and he hit me on the leg and I jammed the screwdriver in the torpedo release, and it drops. So, I felt good about that. Jack, the, uh, the tor torpedoes were hung underneath the wings? Yeah, they're, they're between the engine and the uh, fuselage, underneath the wing. And we, so had, we had a bomb base, the, the regular bomb base that opened up were in the engine of the cells, but of course the torpedo was too big. Well, it had to be on the outside. So, so the bombs were in the bomb bay by the engine. The, the uh, uh, torpedoes were hung on the wing. Uh, what other kind of armaments did, uh, did you carry? Well, of course, each gun we had the bow turret, 250 caliber, the top turret, 250 caliber, the tail turret, 250 caliber, and two waist guns with the 50 caliber. So, so we carried, carried, carried two Tommy guns, two carbines in the airplane, too. <laughs> and we each had a 38 caliber pistol. Did, uh, uh, were there ever any encounters of, of the uh, PBM with Japanese uh, planes? Jap with Japanese planes? Oh yeah, all the time. Uh, we didn't have too much trouble. We were followed and uh, a couple of them came up on us from behind just we were going to fire the appeal off and stuff. It was usually at night. One of our planes was shot down by a Black Widow, B-61. Oh. And uh, we encountered a lot of flare-dropping jack planes. I don't know if they're trying to drop bombs on us. I've heard they tried that too, but uh, they, the jack plane above us and dropped flares. We don't know if they bombs drop it. Uh, so, 
our actual encounter was between Mexico and the rest of the squadron did encounter them. Well, when, when you were on missions, did you uh, have any escorts by other Navy planes, or were you just kind of out there on your own? We flew alone most of the time, a thousand miles in the Jap territory. Sometimes the Navy or Air Force, or Army Air Force, would ask us to go along when they were going on a bombing mission or something, just to stand by in case they had to ditch. But uh, we didn't actually have an escort ourselves. Uh, how long were you uh, in service in the Pacific? Did you go through a VG day? Well, I was I was in the Navy two years and six months, and about two years I was in the Pacific, I guess. Were, were you uh, were you present in Tokyo Bay for the surrender? We didn't go up to Tokyo Bay, but we did occupy Japan, uh, Sasebo, uh, in Kyushu, right after the war. We got uh, that, we told, I said, our plane site, and we got another new PBM. But it has much new stuff on it. It had a radar bombing, stuff that I didn't know how to do, and it had that self to be gun sights on the guns, and I didn't know how to work those. I used, I used to know how to use the Norton bomb site. Oh, so you had the Norton on the PBM? Yeah, yes, we had the Norton bomb site. So it was all low level, so we never used it in anger. Yeah. The pilot would drop a pickle. You know, where, uh, where are there any PBMs in museums today? There's only one in the Prima Air Museum in uh, Tucson, and that's a transport version. It's also an amphibian version. They only made about 13 of those. But it's not a combat version. But that's only one. Can you describe the difference between the amphibian and the combat? version? Well, the first uh, PPMs that made the amphibians were combat versions. They had the gun turrets and everything on them. And of course, uh, after they retired them to make them transport, they just took out the gun turrets and covered them over with metal and stuff like that. And so it was more or less a transport plane. It could land on land and water. But it wasn't very successful because it was too heavy. Well, now the PBY could do both, right? Yeah. Interesting. What was uh, one of the most harrowing experiences you ever had in your uh, PBM experience in World War II? Well, I remember we were in Hawaii to shovel off for Saipan. And the day before the shovel off, we were supposed to go to a church service if we wanted to. Well, I didn't, so I wasn't religious to speak of. So I didn't run out to the plane and bore sight the guns, the, the sight the gun sights and so forth. And so later on in the war, we were in Okinawa, and we were, this particular day we had the duty we weren't supposed to fly. We uh, did executive or administrative work and things like that, but all of a sudden, and I was sick that day, and I was very glad. I was nauseated and it's a terrific headache, and, Lay around my bunk, and all of a sudden, with a speaker, crew two lay up the gangway, prepared for flight. So I put on my way west and strapped on my 38, and went up the gangway with the other half of the crew, because there was only half of the crew on the airplane. And it turns out my pilots had volunteered to attack, to attack a 20 ship Jap convoy coming out of the Yellow Sea. This was going to be at night, this was the afternoon, it went on. So I was so sick, but I could have gotten out of it, but you know, I don't want to stay behind when your crew's going out, so I got on the plane and we took off, and I went to my battle station, which is the bomber's panel, controls the uh, intervalometer and the bomb switches and the bomb bay doors and all that kind of stuff, and I lay down with the earphones on with a bucket next to me to throw up into, and after a few hours, our great radar discovered the Jap convoy. So we went in about 50 feet, and the, the proverbial, proverbial fireworks display. At that time, I prayed to God, make me well. And I was well just like that. It was completely clear, headed, and the nausea gone, and everything. 
He went in, dropped our bombs, and the tail gunner said we hit the fans hill the Japanese uh, tanker. At the same time, we were hit by a five-inch shell that went one, one, through one side and out the other. It did not go off. We figured that it was too low to arm itself because the shells and bombs were made not to go off too close to their own ships. We were so low it didn't arm itself and exploded after it went through. Our flight engineer was sitting on the back of a seat with his feet on the seat. And he'd been hitting, sitting naturally, he lost both his legs. But when it cut our air around the cables, just like you there, and so we had to fly back on trim tabs. And uh, we were kind of all, there was six planes, three planes from our squadron and three planes from another, because they didn't want one squadron to lose so many planes. And that's about the only time we went with another squadron, all the time we were all just ourselves. And uh, we were talking back and forth, uh, conversing right here on the earphones, you know, what was wrong with us. So luckily, nobody was shot down. There was a lot of damage. Some planes lost their engines and a lot of holes in the hull and all that kind of stuff. But I was only here to call on the earphones. The submarine was down there. They said they were listening to our monitoring our calls and we had any problem just to land and pick us up. And I thought that was very nice. So we got back and home landed safely. Uh, we were kind of afraid of the landing because we had to fly back on trim tabs. And that's okay, so it's falling, flying <laughs> full speed, but when you slow down, there's nothing to control, so we just kind of hope the wings will stay level. When we landed, and we did land, we prepared for a crash landing, and we didn't crash. We Jack, did you uh, have any experience of picking up downed airmen uh, in the water? Yeah, we uh, uh, picked up, that was one of the things we did. Those are our after. We were part-time things, picking up guys. We did all this other stuff, and then in between time to pick up guys were down. We picked up B-29 guys a, a lot. We picked up a crew, the B B-29 guys that went down, and a bunch of big high-ranking officers wanted to go along for a ride to bomb Japan. And so they were so glad to be picked up that they invited us over a party on Tinian, which that would, I'd like to go on, I'd like to be a hero, but we couldn't go, we had to go to Okinawa instead. We were based in Saipan. Uh, as far as uh, picking up downed air crews, uh, the PBYs, the PBMs, and submarines were the primary uh, instruments for doing that, right? Yes. Uh, Lyle, I, I want to mention one thing uh, with, with Lyle, and, and I never remember, is it the first or second Tuesday that you guys get together? But there's, there's a group of guys, they're in the tent on the far side, uh, when, when this is finished today you might want to go over, but uh, th these guys get together, there's what, about half a dozen of you that get together uh, for uh, dinner, lunch, your Marine... Where? In Japan? No, here in... Oh, uh, here? Oh, yeah, we've got together a number of times. Go ahead. And they've also published a book. Did you bring a copy of your no, book? No, I didn't bring a book. We yeah. have more work if you want to take a look at it. Yeah, that's, that was a... We, we timed it very well <clears throat> because of the 22, 23 guys that wrote, half of them have died since 19... or from, from uh, 07. So, uh, and it's been very successful. We had some people that refused to write in it because they said no one would read it, and, uh, and it was wasted time. Well, we went, those of us that did it, we got it published. We were out of books in six months, so we had to get it reprinted. And it's been, we've had many very good compliments uh, on it. So, uh, and I should have brought a book over. And you're on your second or third printing now? We're on the third printing now. Third printing. We won't be printing anymore. So we have about 100 books left, and that's it. <clears throat> By the way, could I say a couple things here? That I just saw two P-51s uh, taxi by, and you mentioned submarines. Now, uh, at the Nimitz Museum in in uh, Fredericksburg, Texas, they had a big uh, 
development down there and they enlarged the museum. So I got a call, would you be willing to come down and sit in on a couple of panels? Well, I always like panels. So anyway, I uh, went down there and they had, they had submarine people and, and, and uh, aviation people together. At one of the panels, it was interesting because we had a P-51 pilot, myself, we had a B-52 pilot, uh, B-24, anyway, and several submarine people. And out of a clear blue sky, the, mo the mo guy that was doing the monitoring, like, like Jim is doing here, Pat is doing, um, he came up and he said, now we have two fighter pilots here, and you have one flying P-51s and one flying Corsairs. Which was the best airplane? We didn't have any idea he was going to ask this question, but uh, I already knew the answer, you know, but I hated to d divulge it right away. So I got thinking about it, and I said, well, if I had to go to war tomorrow, I would want to fly in the Corsair. Now, Jim was next door, sitting next to me, and he flew V-51s, and so I figured he'd probably say about the same thing. And he thought for a minute, and he said, you know, he said, if I was going to war tomorrow, I'd want to be in a Corsair also. <laughs> End of the communications, right there. Uh, and, uh, of course, the Corsair was tough much tougher than the P-51. P-51 could do very well at altitude, but down low, they were not, they didn't have a very good record. And uh, so anyway, that was, that was the conversation. And uh, I, I want to highlight that uh, if you've never been down to Fredericksburg, Texas, the Nimitz Museum is a wonderful visit. It's, uh, what, about 70 miles west of Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And they just put a great new addition on. Uh, they herald the Pacific. It is because Admiral Nimitz was the uh, St. Pat, Commander in Chief in the Pacific, uh, and that was his hometown. And uh, his family actually ran a hotel there. And here's a guy from 400 miles from any water went to uh, uh, Annapolis. And a, a little-known story, uh, as he was an ensign, I think on a destroyer, he actually was court-martialed for running his destroyer aground and having to be uh, pulled off. But the Nimitz Museum, obviously, he became a five-star admiral in World War II, and one of the really great people uh, solid uh, commander and uh, uh, a wonderful museum. Of course, everybody hears about the museum at New Orleans, which has been uh, uh, has emerged from the D-Day Museum, based on uh, Stephen Ambrose, to uh, the, the European War, and now then there's uh, some competition with them to do the Pacific War, but. Uh, Anyway, uh, I know that Lyle's been down there, and uh, we, we have a great relationship with the museum there. Uh, Wait a minute, can I say one other thing? I, I, I was just going to say, I want you guys to, to make a couple of comments, and then we're going to open for questions. One thing about that, that was a, a, a submarine aviation symposium that we had down there. <clears throat> now, listening to Jack here uh, with the PBM, you can't believe the feelings that aviators have for people on the water in, in, in whether it be PBYs or PBMs or submarines or whatever. Every single mission that we went on, whether it was land or water, uh, we watched, we, we had plotted where these submarines were. And you have to remember it up here. You don't want to put it on paper because if you're shot down and the enemy gets a hold of that, they'll know where those people are. So it's just a automatic that you do not write this, you remember where they are. Jack, thanks so much. Well, it, was, it wasn't just Navy, it was, uh, again, those Army Air Force, uh, the B-29s, the 20th Air Force. Uh, Jack, you want to include anything else? Uh, any comments? Uh, I was going to say one thing that ticked me off at the end of the war. The war was over. We were celebrating. We saw pictures. We were we were out there doing the fight, and then we saw pictures of all the girls kissing all the guys, and here we were doing the fighting. 
<laughs> uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Anything? Yes, sir. If, uh, if you would, Jack, describe the physical appearance of a PBL. Two and twin engine? What's a PBM look like? Describe a PBM. Well, well, the biggest thing about it, it has twin tails that stick up at an angle on vertical fins. Go back to the table, that's where I am, it's the bottom yeah. one. You know, if, 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 when we're finished here, if you'll go over to the tent due uh, east of us, Jack's got a uh, booth there, there's two other guys in PBMs, and I think you've got a model in there, don't you? Yeah, uh, There's a model in there, model. so uh, uh, it's a beautiful plane, I, I think. Uh, it's, it's a big airplane. It has two decks uh, forward, the flight deck, and then underneath the galley with a stove, and two burners, and warming oven and stove, and then back part of the plane is four bumps. So it was, you know, we had to stay on the plane in half the, you know, 24 hours a day. It was still kind of comfortable. What was the longest mission on a PBM? Ordinarily, they're 12 to 14 hours, but my longest one was 21.6 hours. It carried that much fuel? That's because we were lost. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it carried that much fuel. It carried that much fuel. We had Bombay tanks at that time. And the only where the Bombay is, we had two big tanks that had gasoline in them, so, that, so we knew it was going to be a long trip. Tell us where you got lost and how you got back. Where did you get lost? Where did you get lost? We were going, we were going to Hawaii. <laughs> we, we had what the plane was called PBM 3D was our plane at that time. And it seems they wanted them out in the Pacific. They didn't want us. They wanted our planes. So we had to bring our planes out to Hawaii and leave them there. And uh, that's when we got lost. Then we came back to the state and we got our new PBM-5, which is a much better airplane. Question here, sir. What are the names of the islands that you flew out of? I, I flew out of uh, Saipan and Okinawa, but uh, PBM were nearly every island you could think of, you know, Philippines, uh, Tarawa, all those, you know, you know and, and Lyle, uh, you were on, it was the Bennington carrier, but you were on a couple of others, right? Uh, combat was uh, all on the Bennington in World War II, and all on the Sicily during Korea. But Korea also was 50% land-based. Uh, land-based in Korea, so you were land-based in Korea? flying out of Japan or where? Oh, we flew, we made a number of missions out of Japan, but mostly on, uh, on Korea. Does somebody has a question? Yes, sir. Did you say the carrier Franklin? The no. Franklin? No, the, the Bennington was in World War II and the Sicily, Sicily in Korea. Okay, well listen, uh, we'll wind it up here. We've got another one starting here in just a minute or two. It'll be on the Vietnam Aviation. But thank these guys. And, and again, they're in their booths over here. Go talk to them and ask them some personal questions. Thank you so much.